This oh, conference sorry. will now be recorded. There we go. I did get warned about that American uh, accent coming in. I should have remembered that. So um, thank you, Jules, uh, and hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to this presentation that's been put together by the technology development team within Network Rail. Uh, and what we'll be looking at today is the principles of point operating equipment, so POE, uh, and more specifically, uh, the high performance switch system, so HPSS, because that's the POE that uh, we and the technology development team uh, assemble, manufacture and distribute across the country. Uh, so POE is quite a broad topic to be covering in the time that we've got, and uh, I'm sure there'll be numerous papers that have been written or IRSE presentations that go into a lot more detail on specific types of POE. But um, what we've tried to do in this presentation is, is give you an overview of the key principles, uh, emphasise some of the interfaces with TRAC and other disciplines, and explain how HPSS aims to address some of these issues. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And um, yeah, as Jill said, we'll be taking some questions at the end. OK, uh, so just to introduce who you'll be hearing from today, uh, my name is Mark Jackson. I'm the Programme Engineering Manager for the Technology Development Team, so TDT. I've been working with Network Rail for about 13 years now. Uh, about half of that's been uh, working in maintenance on the West Coast Main Line, and the latter half working in track renewals in infrastructure projects. Uh, and it was June last year that I came into the fold at TDT, so uh, fairly new to the team. Uh, so it's for that reason that I've brought along my expert, Steve Spurlock, along with me, who's going to talk through all of the uh, technical details. Uh, so Steve's been with the team from the outset, really, and has seen HPSS develop from uh, ideas scribbled down on a piece of paper to the system that uh, we have in track across the country today. So I'll take you through the next few slides and then I'll hand you over to Steve. Uh, so a quick slide on what we'll be covering. So as I said, I'll take you through the technology development team, who we are and what we do. I'll then hand over to Steve, who will take us through uh, the principles of POE, what it is, why we have it and what does it do. Uh, we'll then look at uh, some of the design considerations that go into uh, POE and some of the interfaces with TRAC and other disciplines. Uh, we'll look at some of the different types of POE in use across the country. We'll look at why it's so critical and what happens when we get it all wrong. Uh, and then we'll start to focus in on HPSS. So uh, Steve will give us a, a brief history of uh, how it was developed, how we got to where we are today. Um, we'll look at some of the populations uh, across the country. In fact, Western are one of HPSS uh, big supporters. They've got quite a high number of HPSS uh, in situ. And also there's a large project coming up uh, this summer, which I'm sure a lot of people on the call will be involved in, uh, Bristol East Junction Renewal. Um, we're currently providing all the HPSS for all of the point ends for that project. Uh, and then we'll finish off with looking at some new developments. So we're in the latter stages of developing HPSS Mark II. Again, Western are um, key players in helping us get that approved. Uh, had a lot of help from uh, the RAM Matt Redstone uh, in that project. And we'll look at uh, a couple of other ideas of where we want to take POE uh, once Mark II is finished. OK, then. so technology development team, who are we and what do we do? So TDT stands for Technology Development Team, and we're part of the Network Services Directorate within Network Rail. Um, we're based in Western Supermare, uh, and we are the design authority for HPSS. So we're responsible for purchasing all of the required parts, so nuts, bolts, washers, electronics equipment, base plates, et cetera, et cetera, that goes into making up that HPSS system. We then assemble it in our workshop in Western Supermare, test it, ship it to one of the SNC build-up yards across the country, where it's then put onto panels, uh, tested again, uh, and then sent on to track renewals. It's not just new stuff that we provide. Um, we're also responsible for the provision of spares and tools across the country. So we will backfill um, the, the nine new regional delivery centres. So NetRail's got nine RDCs. Um, so we'll backfill them with HPSS stock so that they can fulfil any orders that the maintainers have for, for spare parts or tools. 
Uh, we're also the authors of all the user guides, all of the training, uh, pretty much anything that you find HPSS related on the NR standards website, that, that all comes from us and we're the owners of that. Uh, and also customer support. So we're on the end of the phone um, or email. Uh, we can visit site if required. Um, we also do a lot of work with customer returns. Um, so fault finding uh, and we'll feed those findings back into the continuous improvement of our, of our design of our system. Just a quick slide on the history of the team then. Uh, so this team were actually a different company altogether um, prior to Network Rail purchasing them uh, in 2012. So originally they were part of Fairy Hydraulics and, and worked on aerospace flight control systems. So some of the examples uh, in the pictures on the right of the slide there. Um, bottom right is the RAF Tornado. So the team were working on uh, some of the actuation systems uh, for those fighter planes. In the early 90s, then the company diversified into other industries. So rail being one of them, uh, and that's when IAD was born, so the Industrial Actuation Division. Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with uh, HPSS, uh, you'll recognise that name. Uh, and IAD, in fact, is still yeah. a number of uh, network rail documents and, and systems. Um, it's a bit of a common misconception, actually, that HPSS is still provided by external company, um, when in fact, as I said, it was it was bought in house by Network Rail in 2012. So in 2012, uh, it came into Network Rail, uh, became part of Route Services. It then transferred as part of a reorg into STE, so the Safety, Technical and Engineering function, uh, which no longer exists, um, in December 2018. It was at that, that point that it was renamed the Technology Development Team. So the idea being that um, as well as supporting HPSS going forward, uh, we'd also use the engineering expertise within the team uh, to apply it to other to other systems within the railway, like uh, level crossing barriers, for example. Uh, and then in 2020, uh, so June last year, and this is when I came in and, and took over the team, uh, they transferred into technical services, uh, and that was as part of the putting passengers first reorganisation. So the team's been uh, around the houses a bit in network rail, and it, it's probably fair to say it hasn't always been plain sailing. Um, we are due another move shortly, um, so we're going back full circle, back into roof services as part of the next stage of putting passengers first reorg. Um, it's a bit unfortunate there's been as much upheaval as there has, but I think we are going back to the right place um, and put this a good place to, to serve our customers who, who are in the routes. Um, I mean, in the fairly short time that I've been with the team uh, and seeing the engineering expertise we've got and the products that we've got and the services that we provide, I'm pretty confident we can make it a success, no matter where we end up in network rail, really. So um, that's it from me. I could probably talk about the, the future plans for TDT for another 20 or 30 minutes, but I'll let Steve get on to the stuff that we're here to talk about today. So, Steve, if I click on the slide, you let me know when you want, and I'll, I'll move on for you. Certainly. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Mark. I've said that story so many times on board of hearing myself say it, so I'm glad someone else has told the uh, history of the team. So let's go straight into the uh, more interesting technical aspect of the thing. And I, and I should just say from the outset, I'm neither a signalling engineer nor a track engineer. So if I do get a few bits of terminology wrong, please, please be gentle with me. Uh, next slide, please. OK, why, why do we have POE? Uh, it's it's an intrinsic part of an S and C system, and S and C, as we know, steers trains safely from one track to another. Uh, there's a number of reasons for that, but um, I don't probably don't need to explain to people with a railway background that are all in 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 the forum now exactly why we need it. But um, it's it's a safety critical element of the railway. And within that, the POE is, is, is the safety critical device that carries out the actuation, which is the, the, the moving of the switch rails from one uh, route to, to the other side, to the other stock rail. And it's then locking it safely in position 
and it's detecting that it is both locked and in the correct safe position, which will then allow the new route to be set by the signalling system to allow the passage of trains onto the alternative route. It fundamentally consists of uh, the, the, the point machine itself, which we'll come to in a minute, uh, supplementary drive on longer switches where you've got long switch rails, you need to ensure that the whole of the movable part of the switch and crossing moves pretty much at the same time. You maintain gauge via stretcher bars and the whole thing is locked safely in, in, in position without loss of gauge and without trapped um, objects between the closed stock and switch rails. And therefore, for that reason, we have the supplementary detection, which is usually one or two pairs of, of supplementary sensors down the length of the switch, such that if a bit of ballast or a tin can or anything gets obstructed in the closed side, we would we would detect it and we would not give detection to back to the signaling system. Therefore, we'd keep a red light until the, the problem was cleared. Yes, please, Mark. Okay, this is this is quite a busy slide, and um, probably a message I'll give you for the rest of the slide. I'm not going to talk through every single element on every single slide. Hopefully, you'll all get a copy of this after the chat. But it hopefully is is annotated such that you can understand some of the nomenclature we use in POE. I've mentioned the point machine, back drive, detection. The, the two boxes shown in yellow are probably quite important because particularly for trains moving into the points towards the switch toes, that's known as a facing move. And that is the more critical move in the sense that if something isn't locked or, or there's a problem with the toes of the rails not in the correct position, that is an extremely dangerous situation compared to the trailing move, which tends to be a safer way. So therefore the facing point lock and detect is, is completely safety critical. And I'll come on to how we do it with the HPSS probably a little bit later on. Different point machines detect in different ways, but fundamentally you have to convince the signaling system that you are locked and in the right position and it's safe for trains to, to move over the switch and crossing. Yes, please, Mark. Okay, we, we've tried to put a, a, a little sort of mind map together. It's a little bit small in font, but the emphasis I'm trying to give with this slide is that S&C systems and POE are at the conjunction of a number of engineering and technical disciplines in the railway. You've got track elements, you've got signaling elements, you've got ballast track support, points heating, you might have remote monitoring. Not only that, you then have to consider the passage of trains. You have to also consider, and it's one of the things that is extremely difficult to de design against, and that's the real world environment. And some of the early issues we had with designing HPSS, which I'll probably touch on later, were where we fell foul of, of just the railway environment, the real world, the hammering that this type of equipment gets day to day from axles, trains, um, but not only the physical uh, problems we've had, there are things like um, traction current returns and electromagnetic capabilities of the equipment to not be uh, knocked out by the passage of trains because the HPSS, for example, uses electronics and therefore we could be susceptible to stray um, currents and radio signals, that type of thing. So part of the development process, which I'll come to later, was to make sure we were adequately safe and completely safe to, to run on the railway. Some of the key little notes at the bottom there. Um, the problem with a lot of POE is that it can be adversely affected by track and track support, and particularly the old enemy, which is voiding. And some of the 
older POE in the railway, we'll come to in a minute, a lot of the actuation and detection rodding and actuation is in the track beds between the bearers and therefore it's very difficult to maintain S and C such that you don't get voiding and, and therefore eliminating big vibration and shock problems that you may have, which is why a lot of POE is now in bearer and it makes it a lot more easy to, to maintain. The final point on this slide is there's been a, a change in philosophy over the years. When POE was first in the ground, and certainly we were advised at the time of developing HPSS, if in doubt you drop detection, it's the safest option, let someone go out, let someone understand what the problem is, rectify it, then let the trains carry on running. That is just not an option in this day and age. We have to keep the railway running, keep the passengers happy. Therefore, all the design effort at the moment and the focus is A, on making systems reliable and more reliable. And in our new development, which I'll come on to in a later slide, we are developing a system that can run safely in a degraded mode, i.e. it has a fault noted, but we, we maintain safety and keep the railway running. Yes, please, Mark. OK, this is going to be a very brief overview of what's in the, the railway today. And as you can see, there's, there's just over 20,000 point ends and therefore point operating systems in the railway. There's probably some f familiar names on that list, headed by both Clamplock and HW. And as the, as the bullets on the right show, there's a multitude of different technologies in POE. Clamplock, for example, is, is a hydraulic, electro-hydraulic system as is the, the newer high drive system. A lot of the older systems, HWM63, are electromechanical. And HPSS, ironically, we work for a company called Ferry Hydraulics. We chose not to use hydraulics for actuation as the electromechanical systems are more reliable and more energy efficient. And you can generally get the force and the load where you need it whereas hydraulics are a little bit more susceptible to drive at the point of weakest resistance. So that said, there's also the supplementary drive side of POE where the older style actuation of the, the rear of the switch is done through bell cranks and rodding, which again is fairly inefficient and prone to problematic track as, as, as the mechanism tends to bind up and goes out of adjustment if there's problems. The more modern method mechanically is to use torsional back drives which translate lateral movement of the switches into a torsional drive along the switch and then uh, lateral again at the rear of the switch where you actually need all the force in a, in a switch to actually move the rails. So in essence a, a whole switch system is the wrong way around in the sense you really want the point machine at the rear where you want all the force but you have to make sure that the toe is locked which is why it's the way around that it is yes please mark okay um i won't spend too long on these because i think we've already introduced these but i, I, I think the pictorials that you can see there explain what i've just said the First picture of the HW, you can see the amount of rodding that goes under the stock rail and across to actuate the rails and also to uh, join up to make sure that the detection is actuated as well. So the chance of going in to either of those beds, either side of sort of bearer zero, one and two, are pretty remote and it's very difficult to pack under the bearers or, or even tamp. So it, it's quite often the case that, that failures with HWs, for example, are down to poorly maintained P-way at the toe of the switch, which means that it's also compounded by the fact that the point machine, the grey point machine you can see there, is actually mounted on bearers one and two, so that any misalignment between those two bearers means that you can start twisting rods, which may foul under the foot of the rail and would cause actuation or detection issues 
So that was one of the things we looked at when we designed HPSS. We, in right from the get-go, we said we won't have any actuation or detection elements in in the beds. We will have it all in bearer to try and improve reliability and main, maintainability as well. Second picture of the clamp lock, similar story. Although it's a different device, that's a, that's a hydraulic device that, that, as the name implies, clamps the, the, the switch rail to the stock rail. It's still mounted in, in the bed and, and there are still issues with reliability of, of that particular device. What they've done more recently is there's now a thing called the in-bearer clamp lock, which, as the name implies, is now mounted in a, in a steel bearer, which gives much better performance makes it more maintainable and it's also used in the more recent innovation which is the high drive uh, which we'll come to on the next slide i believe and then the third one in the in the the, the row of three pictures there is the m63 which is an old westinghouse design not so many of those in service but you can see if you look closely there are two um, side exits from that that box there one of which is actuation and the others are detection rods so again, similar to the HW in that the rodding goes under the stock rail to actuate and detect the switch rails. Similar problems in service as, as with the HW. Yes, please, Mark. The one thing I should have said earlier on on the last slide, but don't, don't, don't sort of wind it back. Those three designs, the 63, as the name implies, was introduced in the 1960s. The other designs go back to the 50s and 60s. So it's pretty old technology, although the counter argument is obviously it's well proven, it's a known entity, and it is still performing quite well in a lot of the less arduous routes on the railway. So, so we shouldn't sort of ignore it, but there are some problems with HW, for example, with motors burning out and that type of thing. Coming on to the high drive, that, as I said, is a fundamentally uh, an in-bearer hydraulic clamp lock, which is shown that you can see the two yellow boxes at the front there in, in bearer number one. And then the supplementary drive is an, what's known as a, an SO back drive, which is made by Alstom, which again uses hydraulics to actuate at the various drive points down the switch. So in, in essence, it's an entirely electro-hydraulic uh, set of PoE, which again has both advantages and, and disadvantages. One of the disadvantages with the longer switches is that it's quite power hungry and therefore you probably need a second pump unit. Therefore you need uh, to double up on your power supplies, which in more remote areas can, can often be a problem. The other problem with hydraulics obviously is if a, if a hose bursts, you you have you can have safety issues and also in these days of, of being very green and being very aware of green issues if you suddenly dump tens of liters of oil on the ground you you can have serious concerns from for the environment and that isn't for me to set up and do my salesman job on saying the hpsa the last in the bunch is, is the best of the lot um i'm not stating that but what I will state is we tried to take all the elements of, of the designs of the other point machines and try and design out the areas of perceived unreliability and to design in some new features of our own such that we would make HPSS as, as reliable, if not more reliable than, than other systems. And we didn't start off too well on that front, and I'll come to that a bit later on. But we've learned a lot of lessons over the years, and one of our key drivers here is, is continuous improvement using the performance data we get to feed into the next generation of, of design. Next slide, please. One of the things that this slide tries to explain is that going back to the 1950s and 60s compared to today, it's chalk and cheese. The, the amount of trains, the amount of tonnage, the speed, and, and the sheer um, availability of the track to, and, and signaling systems to be able to carry out 
any form of meaningful maintenance is hugely reduced these days. And so therefore reliability is the watchword. And we try to make HPSS what we call fit and forget with only a requirement for an annual maintenance check. One of the things it does have in it is, uh, for one example, is a, a brushless motor. Therefore, you never have to change out the motor in its lifetime. We also use position sensors on the switch and stock rails, which are non-contact, but give continual output of the distance between the stock and switch rails. So we're detecting them at all times which is what the electronics unit looks at. So, so we've tried to design in this fit and forget mentality, low maintenance, which is where all POE needs to go to. And we're also coupling it with remote condition monitoring, which I'll come to in a, in a further slide as well. Yes, please, Mark. Slightly uh, negative section if you want, but we have to consider what happens with poe and therefore snc if it does go wrong nothing in life is is perfect and if any set of points fails to fully actuate across to make up to the opposite switch rail if it fails to lock fails to detect where the switch rails are then the signaling system will fail safe and it will put a red light up which is what none of us want to see because nine times out of ten that will usually equate to a service affecting failure, i.e. a train delay, passenger dissatisfaction. And also in this day and age, and, and heaven forbid, we've had some horrible examples very recently with some of our colleagues. If you have to get staff on track in quite dangerous times, then it means people are exposed to high risk and we don't want that. Therefore, what we're trying to do is, as I said in an earlier slide, we're trying to design in monitoring that will help us predict and prevent to, to allow us to do maintenance in quiet time, if there is such a thing anymore. But we have to get smarter and the whole railway has to get smarter such that we can try and A, eliminate the problems and B, deal with them more effectively when something does go wrong. Next uh, slide, please. This is, this is really at the horrible end of what goes wrong. We can probably all very vividly remember both Potter's Bar and Grey Rig. And sadly, both incidents happened in and around S&C and points. In the case of Potter's Bar, there was a stretcher bar had, had worked completely loose. And unfortunately, the whole set, the whole set of the switch rails moved under a train with the horrible consequence of, of loss of life. Similarly, Grey Rig was a single point end, which again moved under the train. <sighs> Tragic consequences, but it, it focuses the mind on the safety criticality of S&C and point operating equipment and why it is so critical to be set up, maintained and working correctly. I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and try and do the holier than thou thing about HPSS. But the one thing from, from the early days was we recognized that the, having done all the hazards and the, the risk assessment, the concern was if the open switch rail does work itself loose or a stretch of our brakes, you've got a, a, a flailing length of steel that you just don't know where it is and potentially it can cause derailment or worse. And so therefore we said right from day zero, we will try and detect both the closed switch and stock rail and the open switch rail such that we always know where, where it is relative to the its adjacent uh, stock rail. So we know both the closed side, which effectively is zero, and the open side, which should be uh, whatever the free will clearance allowance is 112 millimeters i believe it is and therefore we detect all of those things on on hpss so so one would like to think it's a safer railway in that respect yes please mark 
Thank you. We've done a bit of a trawl, and this pie chart uh, is, is the result of us assessing POE service affecting failures. And this isn't HPSS, this is all POE uh, and what has caused uh, a service affecting failure in the live railway. And POE itself, which as I say on the top right there, is, is the sort of the mechanics of the point operating equipment. For the purposes of today, and I'm not pointing any fingers, but 25% pretty much on the track side of things is, uh, which is the blue segment on top right, that is all track related uh, causes of POE failures. It could be uh, voiding, it could be induced vibration, which as I say in, in the bottom of right of the slide, vibration is the enemy of POE. And if, if you're not able to maintain, tra maintain track very well, then it can often lead to points uh, failures. And we've had n a number of those over the years with HPSS as well. But I think if I was to show another slide, which we don't have included here, we do one similarly when we do this talk about HPSS, we've probably got about 30 contributors to, to failures. So it's a very complex system, as I said earlier on in that little um, mind map I showed. There are a lot of inputs and outputs from a POE stroke S&C system, and therefore you lose one of them and you can often cause a train delay. Yes, please. Okay, we'll just go back a little bit in time. Um, we we started this project many, many years ago now. It seems like only yesterday, but uh, it's all that while ago. But I think really all I wanted to say on this one is that the route to product acceptance within network rail is, is quite a, an arduous and tortuous one, which has to be welcomed because as I said earlier, if you get it wrong, you can have another potter's bar in your hand. So the safety case work and the trials that went on were numerous and extensive. And we finally got six years after starting, we got the safety case for the facing point. It's called a trial there. It actually was two units that went into Nunhead Junction, which is uh, in Delboy country in, in Peckham in London. And it's one of the busiest junctions in network rail. So we, we had a real baptism of fire with our first two installations. And thankfully, it's still in and running, I do believe. In 2001, we then had full product acceptance, which meant we then increased the full speed allowance up to 125 mile an hour, facing trailing, third rail, uh, 25 kV overhead lines, uh, any application basically for both uh, SEND 56 and SEND 60 rails. Yes, please, Mark. It's a system designed for 25 year life in line with the current point operating equipment spec. Um, and we designed it to have just the annual inspection, which is what we said earlier, which having done the sums, we believe it has a very competitive whole life cost maybe a slightly more expensive system, but we believe, particularly when we get the new development, which I'll come on to in a few slides time, we believe it will become an extremely reliable system and therefore the whole life cost model will be even more competitive with any other comparable POE. As I said, it's designed for use in high speed, high tonnage lines. And from a track perspective, it is a fully tampable design we have got pictures coming up to show tamp tamping in and around the point machine. So um, it may be that in the Q and A session, people do question that. There has been a few. There have been a few queries over the years where people have said, "Oh, we we can't fully tamp HPSS," but but we have plenty of evidence to say yes, you can, and and it it, it tamps with no problems at all, with, with no damage to the system. So, so it is fully tampable in our opinion. The real brain of the system is the electronic control unit, which is, you could, if you've got eagle eyes, you can see it bottom right with, where the mouse is pointing. That's actually mounted virtually trackside. 
And when I mentioned earlier on about the electromagnetic compatibility of the system, we have to be very aware of that with very complex electronics right next to the railway. We have to be absolutely bulletproof against all manner of electrical noise. And we think we've got it pretty well sussed these days. We fully understand what, what makes the electronics tick. And the beauty of the electronic control system is you can do a lot of real time monitoring that other point systems can't do because we are monitoring 24 seven, the position detectors, the lock detection, the health of the system. And effectively you get it for free from the system. And we'll come on to how we then tie that into the remote monitoring system. And I think I touched on it earlier. We use linear sensors. They're known as LVDTs. They are um, basically detecting all the time the gap between the closed switch and stock rail and the open switch and stock rail. So we know where every key detectable point of the POE is at all times. Yes, Blue. Uh, I'm probably repeating myself now, so I don't need to say too much about this slide. I think the one thing that's worth picking up on is the third item down on the right. The actual way of setting up HPSS is, is simplicity personified because all the smart setting up information is built into the electronics. What the handset allows you to do is it's plugged in when the thing is set up in the railway and you effectively drive the points to normal and or reverse, whichever way you start with it. Once it's locked and in position and you've checked visually that it is in position, you literally press a button on the handset and it establishes the zero datum for the closed side. And equally, it sets a detection window for what we call the zero point, but for the open switch rail the other side. We then drive the points the other way and do the opposite, press the button and it sets up the other windows. And so therefore, you've got detection windows for both, both the open and the closed switch rails. I hope that's clear because I'm waving my arms around, but you can't see me trying to demonstrate what closed and open switches look like. I'm sure you know that. But we detect both open and closed uh, windows. So we, we are fully aware of those limits at all times. And then once you press the go button on the handset, that has then enabled what's called a datum reset. And then the system is available to be patched into the signaling system, which then so therefore the points can operate that whole setup takes a matter of three or four minutes probably which is fantastically quick and therefore it means you don't have to do any arduous setting up with gauging or anything probably the other thing to point out at this point is that the method of uh, drive of the hpss is something that i liken to having a motorized g clamp um, if you can imagine how a G clamp works and it locks on itself to hold the thing it's clamping against in position, that is effectively what HPSS does. It's got an Acme threaded lead screw driven by the motor. We drive the switch rails to close the gap, whichever way it's operating. When the thing is in position, we drive to stall. We don't drive to any pre-determined position we drive to stall so we drive hard against the stock rail when the detection system detects there is zero gap and the stall current is rising we can see that the thing is starting to rise the electronics takes over and it says have i traveled from one side safely to the other side have i traveled a minimum distance of 100 millimeters minimum have I met the opposite rail? Am I within detection window on both the open and closed side? Are the brakes locked? Has the motor stopped? And a number of other checks. When all of those uh, boxes have a tick in them, the logic ands them all together and says, I am safe, I am in the commanded position, and therefore we give the signal back to the detection system. So it's got a huge number of safety checks every time it operates and it's monitoring 24 seven as well. 
Yes, please, Mark. Okay, I've mentioned it a few times. All of the operational HPSS in the railway uh, have been fitted with RCM, remote condition monitoring, which is the little yellow module you'll see on the side of the machine. This connects wirelessly with the intelligent infrastructure system. And the beauty of this is, as you can see from the, the, the graphic on the right hand side, that's what the um, what they call them flight engineers have so that if an alarm goes off, if we've exceeded one of our preset parameters within the intelligent infrastructure system, it will set an alarm going and the flight engineers can determine whether it's a, a critical alarm, i.e. We've, we've got a, a, a service affecting failure. Hopefully it's more of a warning alarm because we've encroached within the parameters of the boundaries of the operating parameter and therefore we flagged that, that the system could go into a degraded state at a point in time coming up, which allows us, as the title of the slide says, to predict and prevent. Because we want to try and prevent failures before they occur, we do not want to stop trains. The other key thing, which I talked about earlier, is we want to try and keep staff off the track. And if we can carry out maintenance or faulting in quieter time, safer time, we want to do that. And so therefore it's it, it's got a huge number of benefits. The other the other analogy I always trot out when I give these talks is imagine you've got a single point end up a remote valley in Wales or, or out in Scotland somewhere and you've got to go and do some simple little checks every six weeks, 12 weeks, whatever it may be. You can often spend a whole day driving up to an asset to look at it, to just give it a visual check, to find out that the thing was working perfectly anyway. Whereas with remote monitoring, you really have got the benefit of seeing real time and remotely that the asset is, is in perfect working order and you don't need to waste valuable resource in, in going and confirming what you really already know. So it's got huge benefits, I believe, to the railway. And we don't just use it on HPSS or POE. It's used in a lot of other areas. And, and we need more and more of it, in my view. Yes, please, Mark. As I mentioned earlier on, HPSS can be fully tamped. That's a picture, of, I, I, I'm not a railway nerd, so I couldn't tell you which, uh, which particular junction that is, but it is an old high lid HPSS, so I do know it's, it's a fairly old asset. But as you can see, the switch can be fully, fully tamped through and uh, it's fully, you know, the thing is fully operational. We don't have to disconnect anything. Uh, and, and, and we've had no problems to, to the best of my knowledge. We can also do, uh, stone blowing we've we've had big discussions with the stone blowing team and i believe they do that as well although please feel free to correct me if i'm slightly askew with that comment uh, and we've recently got approval for dts the dynamic track stabilizer to be used with um hpss as well so so it's all about keeping the thing in service and properly maintained thank you mark This graphic really just shows a bit of a breakdown as to where HPSS is across the country. And other than East Anglia, I think it's, it's, it's spread far and wide. The abundance of HPSS is pretty much, as you can say, in the green sector. There's 200 plus of them on West Coast South. Um, I said that Nunhead Junction was a baptism of fire when we first went into the railway. We were then, uh, uh, when we were pre-network rail, we were partnered with Balfour Beatty, as it was in those days, the, the San Diego team. And they had been very proactive in developing the RT60 switch designs, which, as some or many of you may well know, weren't a great success early, early, early doors because there were a lot of 
uh, problems with, with the actual switches themselves. But because they put in a lot of those switches with HPSS, unfortunately, we were guilty by association and we had some horrendous uh, actuation problems. There really were a lot of problems with those switches. So we were not flavor of the month, it's fair to be uh, said, in those days. And one of the thoughts in retrospect and in hindsight, using the live railway, railway as a test bed is not, is not a great idea. Hence the reason we still use the old Dolby or, or Melton track now, which is where developments really should be. Um, because trying to do development work in a live railway is, is never a good idea. So uh, we, we, we had a second baptism of fire. The other one to point out is bottom right, we've, we've got 41 ends in uh, St Pancras. So if ever you use Eurostar going across uh, the channel, all the point ends in the St Pancras station are, are HPSS and it's probably some of the most reliable PoE assets that we operate. So although it's run by HS1, it is maintained by, by Network Rail. So we do get some good feedback from that team and some useful feedback as to how they make their asset more maintainable and more reliable than, than some of the other HPSS assets. So it's a useful uh, two-way exchange of ideas. Yes, please, Mark. Okay, we're sort of looking to the here and now and, and the future. The picture there is, is our test panel within this uh, operational facility and probably to the untrained eye you think that's exactly the same as the old one and i think the the the, the watchword here the, the the key phrase is it's 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 evolution not revolution we're trying to build on the hpss mark one design we're trying to design out the areas of uh, unreliability vulnerability or lack of maintainability uh, there's a lot of illities in that in those uh, words, but as you can see from the bullet points, uh, we're using the latest uh, NR-approved Schwehag base plates, which we've built into the design. But the real the real benefits, I think, are the second bullet point. We've really improved the maintainability. The original design had some horrible bolt-on lids and covers, which were almost buried in the ballast, and it just was so difficult to take them off and replace them and the upshot of that was in all honesty is that often they were replaced with only a bolt or two in place because time had run out or it was difficult to access uh, the the adjacent tap hole and that was a concern to us because there there have been some occasions where those uh, covers have come off under trains which is not a great outcome We've now made a far easier uh, system whereby we use the simple little pegs and R clips, quick to release, quick to replace, quick to secure, which has to be a benefit to everybody. The third bullet point is the really exciting development. The fault tolerant detection, which as the name implies, allows us to work and operate in a slightly degraded state. In essence, what we've done is we've doubled up on the number of toe sensors. So the, the real critical facing point, the, the lock and detection at the toe of the switch, we've now got double the pairs of sensors. They feed back into the electronics unit. But the real beauty, as I said earlier, of electronics is that we've redesigned the logic such that if one or other of the pairs of detectors fails and it could be two but so long as it's the opposing ones not the same two on the same side so long as you've got a pair remaining in service or even three you will still run the railway so in to that end the logic has been changed in the electronics and we get reliability for free effectively because other than a pair of sensors we've built in and almost doubled the likely mean time between service affecting failures of this design because if you cast your mind back to the pie chart that we showed you about 60 percent currently of hpss failures are detection related and probably down to 
faulty detectors which maybe have broken under shock or vibration of trains. By running in a degraded mode, it means that we can, in tandem with the remote monitoring system, we can see that one of the detectors has failed. We're still running the railway perfectly safely, but we can go out at quiet time and we can rectify the fault. So it really is quite an exciting development. We've also built in one or two other little um, bits within that logic to help us eliminate some of the other areas, like we've got two sensors on the brake. We can do either or now rather than both of them. So again, it's perfectly safe, but it means we've got improved availability of the entire system. And the final bullet point is we can now supply with the underbearer pads that are being used in, in some some projects, not all, but that's a very easy thing for us to do. So, so we can accommodate those quite happily. Uh, next slide, please, Mark. That's just a little exploded view of the the new Schwehag base plates. With we with the load support, we 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 have a very chunky uh, load support within the steel bearer. The beauty of that means is that all your load your vertical load from from rolling stock um, goes is earthed through the green object on that picture through the steel bearer and into the into the uh, the, the ballast and the, the 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 track beneath so it's a very robust system but in order to um, gain product acceptance for the, the new HBSS mark II system rather than go into the railway rather than go into the expensive uh, model of doing in-track trials, that type of thing. We are currently testing the whole steel bearer, load support and base plate assembly at Schwehag's facility in Switzerland, where we're going to subject it to 3 million cycles, 30-ton uh, axle representation to try and uh, make sure that it is entirely safe for use in the railway. And we've got it agreed with the technical authority that if we pass all those tests satisfactorily, combined with the finite element analysis work we've done on the whole design, that will satisfy everybody that this is a robust set of POE for the next generation of HPSS. Yes, please, Mark. This one's a bit wordy. Uh, I've probably explained a fair bit of it. Um, are there any points worth picking up on there? All I can do is reiterate probably the fourth bullet point to say that the fault tolerant detection and ECU, the electronic control unit, combined with the remote monitoring, really will enhance points monitoring and this phrase predict and prevent, which will really reduce the number of service affecting failures, we believe. Um, in terms of product acceptance, the other real benefit of this new system, which we find quite exciting, is we are getting parallel product acceptance of both the, the entire Mark II system, and we're also getting a separate approval for the Mark II fault tolerant detection, which means that, and the way we've designed it is, that the Mark II new detection system can be retrofitted onto any of the 600 existing HPSS in the railway. The ECU looks the same, but it's the fault tolerant version and the pairs of tow detectors mounted exactly the same way as the Mark I system. So therefore swapping the two systems out will take maybe an hour or two. And there's no re-signaling required because the signaling feed in the 10 core and 4 core uh, cables that we get from the signaling system, they don't see any difference because all the smart thinking is done within the electronics. We just give the same output as we did before. So it's it's a lot of bang for your buck and it's very easy to retrofit into the railway, which which we find quite exciting. And we hope there'll be quite a bit of take up amongst some of the more critical routes in, in within network rail yes please mark a little bit of uh, forward thinking here 
a lot of what I've said today is about um, system safety, availability, reliability, track maintenance, and ultimately in these troubled times, we have to remind ourselves that we're trying to drive cost out of the railway. So if you look at the top system, that's the existing layout, and you can see that um, although we like to think it's fairly clean and tidy with respect to um, mechanisms in the beds between the bearers, everything else, the system we'd like to design below is a multi HPSS switch layout. But the beauty is with again with electronics, we can have the the first uh, HPSS, which is the one to the very left of the diagram, that will be the, the intelligent HPSS. That the electronics can then drive the other drives, which are the second and third yellow uh, HPSS you can see on that diagram. And using clever motor drive technology, we can drive the switch absolutely parallel to the stock rail because we can gear it just through the electronic motors meaning that you're not bending rails you're not you're not stressing the rails and you can see it's a very clean and tidy switch layout meaning that uh, maintenance of the p-way is 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 far more achievable than with with other with other systems multi drive switches aren't novel because that's how a lot of europe do them and it should also be pointed out that high drive for example is a multi drive set of poe because it's got actuators along the length of the switch but this is going to take it another stage further because we can build in all the smarts that i talked about earlier with uh, fault tolerant detection monitoring real time of the whole switch and therefore we'd like to develop that system but it hasn't got past the we'd like to do it stage uh, so so we're trying to get a bit of um, engagement with the technical authority and the s and c team at milton keynes to try and further these ideas with them as we think it's the sort of way forward the other thing to point out as i said earlier on i believe having done the fag packet calculation i believe that would be a cheaper system uh, and with lower maintenance i think it would be a, a, a much much cheaper whole life cost as well uh, if you look at the switch at the top, that's, I think if I'm right in reminding myself, that's a, an SG switch. The back drive element of that switch is about 70 to 80% of the cost of the POE. So the point machine is the 20%. All the iron work, which you can see, is about 80% of that cost. It's incredibly expensive for a bit of old blacksmithing, in my view. Whereas the system below, will be a lot, lot cheaper because you take a lot of the actuation and the, the, the drive linkages, the steel bearers out of the design and you make it a far, far cheaper design based on my infamous fag packet. So that's the one little sales pitch I've done today probably, so I apologize for that, but it, we think it's a, a, an idea worth pursuing. And I think I've probably talked enough now. So I say my thank yous. I hope I haven't rushed through it, but I, I, I hope I've given a very a good overview of both POE and HPSS and, and the relationship between that and switches and crossings. And with no, uh, no further ado, hopefully we can see whether there are any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, any questions? Please put your name in the chat box, please. Ben, would you like to come and ask a question? Yeah, hi, Gilles. Hi, everyone. Hi guys um it was a question regarding uh an issue that we're encountering encountering regularly with hpss in developing snc renewal schemes um as you're aware uh, matt redstone is a big proponent of hpss <clears throat> um unfortunately western has also had a lot of ssi systems rolled out in the last uh four to five years uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of those contain swinging overlaps uh and an issue we're finding is that 
uh, if you install HPSS within a swinging overlap in reality, you need to undertake a data change because the data doesn't, the timing in the data where it essentially doesn't look for detection, doesn't allow um, enough time for the HPSS because the HPSS takes a little bit longer than other point operating equipments uh, that were around when these SSI systems were first kind of designed. Um, and I was just wondering if you guys were aware of this, um, if there was anything afoot to solve it from a the HPSS end of it. Um, yeah, kind uh, of a bit in, of an in open the word, question. No, um, no we, weren't, we weren't aware of that. We have, we have obviously got approval to work with SSI systems. We've had it a long time. That's the first time I've ever heard that. What I can't do is answer for my colleague, Matt, who's our electronics wing. Okay. But I will make a note of it because it's a concern to me. If it's something we can change, then obviously we would be keen to do that. The last thing we want to do is preclude ourselves from any applications or make uh, one of the things we've always been aware of, signaling design changes are hugely expensive. Um, and mm -hmm. so therefore we would want to try and eliminate that. Uh, yeah, and happy to talk to you in more detail slash get a signaling engineer to talk to you about it because I understand it to a certain point and then, yeah. and then it, yeah. it starts going over my head but essentially it's the signaling data essentially closed its eyes and doesn't look for the detection of the point for a short period of time um, and still allows okay. the signal to remain at amber um, right. or at green in rear of the signal and approach a couple of sections away um, but then if all of a sudden yeah. it does look and the detection hasn't been made uh, it then sees right. There's not detection on the points within this overlap that the train might end up in, so it shoots up a red, um, and you could see the kind of emergency brake applications from trains and stuff. Um, they're not going to run yeah. through the points, I don't believe, but we don't want to be um, mm -hmm. slamming brakes on trains doing 125 miles an hour if yeah, we can no. avoid it. So no. at the moment, no. it's precluding us from yeah installing it in some places or specifying it in some places. Who Who would be the best person for us to speak to on that? Um, if you want to talk in our project specifically, uh, talk to me. I'm Dan as Benjamin okay. Edwards on the system. Um, and a guy in STE that we spoke to about this because we were looking at whether it affected other points, Adrian Gibbs. Right. Was okay. gave us some intelligent infrastructure data on it. Um, and then Matthew Lupton was involved in writing the requirement in the standard for projects to investigate this when installing HPSS. I saw in Matthew's name flash up saying that was my question, so I think you've stolen his thunder there. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to ask a very similar, a very similar question. That's yeah, it's that's primarily really to do harass Matt. And Matt yeah, we won't go into too much detail, detail here, but it's primarily to do with with the fact that the switches take long, slightly longer to throw than conventional machines. And if a later yeah. one throws in a, in a shorter time than the original one, then it's probably gone away. Uh, the standards right. are a bit vague on it and just suggest you might have a problem. Hence why I right. wrote something in saying you need to have a look at this. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I'm happy, okay. I'm happy to speak we'll to you sometime as well. Mm, okay. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ben, Matt, uh, and Steve. Uh, any other questions? I've got another one if no one else has got any Gilles. Well, you're on Matt, go on. Yeah, um, yeah. originally when we were introduced we had to do d specific derailment risk assessments. Has yes. that gone away now? Pretty much, yes. Um, you, I'm guessing you probably know Colin Durans, do you? Yes I do, I do. Is he the best person to speak to yeah. in detail? Yeah, about it? Colin spent a lot of Yes, <laughs> um, I, he's done a lot of work on it and a lot of the, um, with the advent of TPWS and a lot of other protection, yes. I think a lot of the risk has gone away and, and Colin has, the, 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 I think the certificate now has a different set of wording in, in it to, to, to what it had 20 odd years ago. He's, he's a lot more relaxed about it now and I think it's, it's very much a, an arbitrary assessment on a single sheet of paper. But, but um, he's, he, he can give you chapter and verse on that. Yeah, I, personally, I don't think it was any greater than it was with uh, clamp locks anyway. But. No, no, it's, it, but, it, but it, it's a hangover from many years ago. So, yeah. so but Colin, Colin has spent a lot of time. As I say, if you, if you look at the certificate, do you want me to send you a copy of the certificate? No, I can find it. I can, if it's on there, I can okay. find that. 
yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Issue. Yeah, you'll find there's a, it was this issue or the last issue, the wording was significantly changed and it references a, a, a another document or other. I can't remember exactly what it is. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, John Barry, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, just a quick one on power supply. How would it compare to, say, a high drive for a comparable switch? Is it is it quite power hungry or not too bad? It's a slightly difficult one to uh, answer. I, I think you'll find compared to high drive, it's a lot more efficient. The reason I'm sounding hesitant is we take power that charges up a, a bank of capacitors in the electronics and then you get high current spikes but from within those capacitors but i think the overall power um i can't think what the technical term is but the actual power um consumption the overall power envelope or whatever the term yeah. is is is, is, com is is a lot better i believe again if you needed chapter and verse on that matt harris could could give you plenty of information about that sorry i'll just jump jump in there a little bit um Prashant, who works as my signaling PE, is currently working on a notice board with Adrian Gibbs um, and some of the uh, assurance, signaling assurance teams um, on uh, what power ratings to use for different POEs and different combinations of POEs when doing signaling power calcs and HPSS is included on there. And HPSS mm -hmm. is pretty low down the list compared to uh, mm -hmm. other POE. I think it might even be the least power. Oh, hungry. really? Okay. I it's, think it's, so. It's, yeah. It's, it's efficient, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just whenever we show people the power spikes, they they get a bit concerned because it's quite a high peak, but that comes from the power bank internally, not from the external supply. If you right. sort of see see what I'm getting at. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the the one the, the notice board we're working on is again based on intelligent infrastructure information from Adrian. Um, I'm working on some initial and some motoring values and some stall stall values and stuff. So uh, that should be released in the next three months, I hope. So all the signaling guys and your teams will see that come out in their notice board. Okay, cheers, Ben. Nice. Okay, um, just conscious of the time and normally people uh, uh, need to go to other meetings starting uh, at two o'clock. So I, I propose we call this session to, to a close. Um, so I'd like um, uh, to thank uh, uh, both of you, Steve and Mark, for um, really amazing presentation, very interesting, with a lot of interest from our uh, signaling colleagues asking questions at least at, at the end from all parts. <laughs> Um, and um, it's not easy to do um, a round of applause uh, uh, through the media, but um, again, on behalf of everybody on the call, and it was very good attendance today, uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, both of you for taking the time of putting the presentations together and coming on Deliver Us uh, uh, it today. So um, thank you, and um, I'll see everybody again uh, next month for our next meeting. Thanks, Thank Jules. you very much for having us. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Jules. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye.